I don't know. Say it with me. I don't know. Good God, it is liberating. I am a towering mountain of ignorance. I don't know. We're taught to believe that everything has a reason. And so we observe the world, we see what happened, and then we define the thing that happened as the reason the thing happened. But I think a lot of the time we end up mixing up thinking something with knowing something. This is why it can be so impossible to talk about certain topics with certain people. They've tied those suppositions to themselves so tightly with knots of narrative and constructed reality and values that there's just no untying it. And maybe unsurprisingly, in those situations, the best course of action is just to be friends. Maybe even ask them about that thing that they've created because to them, it's immensely valuable. The world as we perceive it, as we've built it inside of ourselves, is a lie that we tell to ourselves, not out of deception, but out of necessity. We have no other choice. We simply cannot understand the world as it is, and so we construct. But sometimes I just have to tell myself the thing that is definitely true, the truest thing I can say, which is that I don't know. This is the Everyone's Agnostic Podcast with Bob Pondillo and Cass Midgley. Welcome everyone to episode 140 of the Everyone's Agnostic Podcast. I'm Cass Midgley. Today I have a 19-minute conversation with Neil Carter on the struggle for ex-Christians to establish personal agency or what Neil calls self-possession. After that, Bob was out of town that weekend, so I asked a local friend, a clinical therapist named Janine, to co-host this episode. We interviewed Trav Mamone. Trav is a bisexual, gender, queer, atheist blogger and podcaster. He has two podcasts, By Any Means and The Bi Skeptical Podcast. He blogs on Free Thought Blogs and has had several articles published in many medias including Humanist.org, Splice Today, and has been featured on numerous podcasts. I've got a couple of announcements coming up March 18th, the Nashville Nuns Convention. The planning for this event and its location, especially by Patrick Horst, has been difficult because they've booked several venues and somebody figures out it's an atheist convention and they conveniently figure out a way to get out of the contract. But at this point, it's going to be at Unity Church in Nashville. And they have a beautiful campus. It's going to be great. Register online before March 12th, and it's only $15 or $20 after that and at the door. I'll be there participating in a panel discussion with other podcasters, including Bobby C. with No Religion Required, Callie Wright with Gatheist Manifesto, Joe Kendick with Unbuckling the Bible Belt, Chris Watson with The Podunk Polymath, Tucker Drake, The Atheist in the Trailer Park, Jen Aldrich, Not Another Atheist Podcast, and more. Headlining at NanoCon is Matt Dillahunty. Five weeks later is ReasonCon in Hickory, North Carolina, the weekend of April 21st. Featured there will be Lawrence Krauss, Aaron Raw, and many others, and a live taping of God Awful Movies podcast. I hope they do the shack. For more information, go to ReasonNC.com. Speaking of the shack, it's out in theaters this weekend. This is the movie based on the novel by William Paul Young, whom I interviewed last summer on episode 106. We had a very candid conversation if you want to check that out. Before we get into the interviews, the word for today's episode is tension. And by that I mean a strained relationship between. Between gender identifications, between sexual orientations between being selfish and selfless, between getting what you want and wanting what you got, between love and hate, between the pursuit of self and the denial of self. These are all tensions that you're going to hear in our conversations. This episode goes out to those trying to discover what or whom they like and are giving themselves permission to like those things or people. To those who eventually, through intensive labor and self-examination, find themselves in the body and mind of what appears to be their own singular, unique person and identity. Mixed with weakness and strength, joy and sorrow, pleasure and pain, and they say yes to it. Welcome to the community of self-lovers who, by simply being honest, make the world a better place. 
In so doing, we project our waning self-dislike on others less and less and own up to what it means to not only be human, but to be ourselves. If you are on this journey, I would like to issue a warning. You will overdo it at first, and it may get ugly and even painful for those around you. You may hurt others, but don't let that stop your progress. Because the ones that truly love you will take it on the chin to see you emerge and will be by your side when the smoke clears. And the others, they just may see you and your imperfectly perfect self and find the permission they need to do their own work toward self-acceptance. But if they do, they just might turn around and hurt you in the process. But you'll recognize what's happening and take it on the chin for their maturation. This is part of the tension the most honest relationship is a love-hate relationship, and yes-sayers know how to abide in it and let love win. We taped the conversation with Trav Mamone on January 28, 2017, and February 26th with Neil Carter. We interview people you don't know about a subject no one wants to talk about. We hope to encourage people in the process of deconstructing their faith and help curb the loneliness that accompanies it. We think the world is a better place when more people live by sight, not by faith. Please subscribe to our podcast and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Our show is available on most podcast platforms. Also, you can support us monetarily in two easy ways. You can pledge $1 per episode or more through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash EA podcast or leave a lump sum donation through PayPal at our website, everyonesagnostic.com. The smallest contribution is greatly appreciated. Our opening monologue is an excerpt from a YouTube by Hank Green titled Towering Mountain of Ignorance. The music behind it is Never Know by Jack Johnson. The segue music on this episode was created by the Barry Orchestra, found at barryorchestra.bandcamp.com. Thanks for listening, and be a yes-sayer to what is. So I'm here with Neil Carter, and um, I follow Neil on Facebook and, and his blog, and uh, he's been on the show twice. Two of the most downloaded shows of all time for everyone's agnostic are Neil Carter shows, and so uh, we're friends, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're companions in this, this work. Anyway, following his stuff on Facebook, I saw this uh, piece where he'd written about, and let me just read the, the question, and, and um, I'm coming back and forth and talking to you in third person and first person, but Neil is on the line. Say hi, Neil. Well, hi, Neil. <laughs> but let me just read what you posted verbatim, and then we'll talk about it. Um, All right. Would you consider yourself self-possessed? in the sense that you typically maintain a clear and firm view of who you are in relationships, setting healthy boundaries, and keeping to them? Were you always that way? If you made progress on this at some point, how did that happen? How did you learn to develop that sense of self that put you in healthier relationships now compared with what you had before?" Unquote. So. I can say, Neil, that my wife and I are going through, I mean, we're 10 years out from Christianity, basically, um, with a lot of steps in, in the meantime, in the, but we're still, <laughs> there's layers to this onion. And mm -hmm. part of it, I mean, one thing in Christianity is that you do not belong to yourself. You're, you've been bought with a price, you're no longer your own. Right. And, and selflessness is a virtue. You're to mm -hmm. take up your cross daily and follow Jesus. Yep. Right. No greater love than a man lay down his life for his friends, you know. So uh -huh. there's there's this great emphasis and exaltation of being void. I mean, even what is it, jars of clay? <laughs> I mean, yep. Paul said that you're empty vessels, and so the and the more empty you are, like John the Baptist said, I become less, so that he can become more. So the more void of of self you are within yes. Christianity is good. Right. And so we have a lot, we have a big hole to crawl out from in the ex-Christian journey to figure out, number one, who am I? What do I want out of life? Mm -hmm. And how right. to, and getting over feeling selfish about that. <laughs> right. Even for asking the question. Yeah. 
because who are you to determine your own path, you know? Yeah. That is something that's very ingrained in us. Well, you know, the word self is a prefix that in Christianity, if you attach it to something, it, it's negative. Yeah. You know, it's always bad if something is hyphenated with the word self, you yeah. know, like self-love and self-interest and self-esteem. <laughs> self-esteem. Yeah, those are all bad Look down things. upon, yeah. Yeah, because you're supposed to get your sense of worth from something or someone else. It's derivative. You know, yeah. all of your worth and identity is derivative from somewhere else. So once you move away from that, it, it has to be rebuilt, sometimes almost from nothing. And yeah. it's got to be re- rebuilt and in, in a different framework, and it's really hard to figure out what that framework is. So that's exactly where I am, is how do I understand how to think about myself mm-hmm. in a way that is healthy even while I'm doing it, feeling like it's bad for me to do that. Yeah. You know, intellectually, I can explain why it's okay to focus on yourself and your own needs, but to actually do it requires getting over an emotional hurdle that is much harder to do. Yeah, I was married for a number of years, and my wife at the time and I spent a lot of time talking about alcohol because we grew up in the Southern Baptist tradition, mm-hmm. and alcohol was bad, except, of course, lots of Baptists still drank, but not our kinds of Baptists. Our kinds of Baptists actually didn't drink, right. and, um, and her family in particular. But as we grew into adulthood and became our own you know, students of the Bible in and of ourselves, we came to believe that there's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol, you know, mm-hmm. and yet— that was still a hurdle that, especially for her, um, she never was able to get over because it was a heavier indoctrination for her and mm-hmm. her family. It started much younger. So even though she could intellectually explain, mm-hmm. yes, in the New Testament, it's fine to drink wine, actually doing it would almost never happen because the emotional impact is still there afterwards, yeah. years later. Yeah, well, yeah, I was about to say, I hear people say that about sex. Even just the notion of hell I've I've talked to people yes. in the last month where it still lingers. They're ex-Christians. Yes. They're atheists. And for the most part, they've moved on. Right. But there's this looming question in the mm-hmm. background. Have, yes. have I really fucked this up, and am I going to hell? It's just right. it's hard to shake. And I can just right. picture your wife, you know, like being at a social gathering and with a glass of wine in her hand and feeling dirty. Right, feeling feel like it's wrong. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the problem with this concept of talking about self, is mm-hmm. that even though I can intellectually explain why it's 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 okay to begin asking questions about what I want out of life and what my needs are. Right. Actually, going through with it is a much harder process. And so, yeah, I asked some Facebook friends, and it was a, it was a limited audience, but I, I asked a handful of friends, uh, and you were in that that group. Um, what what is it that you did or experienced that enabled you to become more of a self possessed person, having a sense of who you are? Mm-hmm. Some people seem to be born with this. You know, they just seem to have it from their earliest days, a, a clear sense of their own direction and their own purposes and their own needs. Their boundaries seem to be healthy from the earliest days. Yeah, but, but that's the nurture nature debate. And I would sure. I would argue that like even in their childhood, if they were allowed to choose their own toys, I mean, all kinds of conditioning can either contribute to or take away from a person's ability to be their own free moral agent. Some people who are like me grow up naturally inclined to absorb the more self-negating messages from their church. Mm-hmm. And so it's a it's a combination of nature and nurture it, to my mind because Always. some people are just they're more predisposed to absorb those messages but then they get the messages too. So you're getting both nature and nurture and they're reinforcing one another whereas other people who grew up in the same environment I did might not have been naturally inclined to be self-negating and self-neglecting. Mm-hmm. And so they just rejected those messages when yeah. they heard them. it just never sank in for them the way it sank in for me. Right. But and for me, those two things met, and it was a perfect storm yeah. to become a self-forgetting person. Yeah, and it, that's one of those messages is God loves you and has a plan for your life. And if somebody comes up with deep insecurities, which everybody has insecurities, but if for some reason somebody's is a little more heightened, then the message of the gospel comes along and says, God has a plan for your life. You're special. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He loves you just as you are. He knows your secrets, and yet he still loves you. Then that can really resonate. And I think this thing of self-possession and agency and self-esteem and self-respect is so directly tied to how much... I, I know when I was looking through the thread of the people that commented on this very question, is the you know the notion of relationships came up so often, and I think of that old country song, looking for love in all the wrong places. Like, we, we are such a black hole of self-loathing that, uh-huh. that we, we are looking for love. We're looking for somebody to love us, and sometimes it's God, sometimes it's a person, sometimes it's both. 
and we can get into very toxic relationships because if there's one thing that is a match made in hell, it's it's a controlling, possessive, insecure person meeting with a submissive, insecure person, and their insecurities and their dysfunction get together, and and you have like almost sadomasochism going on in a in a marriage. Mm-hmm. You have dominance and submission. Mm-hmm. As dysfunctional as it is and an unhealthy as it is, it feels right because for whatever childhood conditioning or whatever, they they like the submission and the other person likes the domination. Mm-hmm. And what we're trying to do, is, if I understand myself, and I can't speak for you, but I think we're both saying this, is that we're trying to get to a place when we're, when we're in relationships – that that teeter totter of one being high and one being low is is like we've got to balance the scales, and that's easier said than done. Right. Two people, two free moral agents, literally equal, looking at each other in the eye, powerful, and getting back to this word self possessive, you don't own me, like right. the, like the marriage vows say, you know, or whatever. Mm-hmm. No, you don't own me. Yeah. And and so, you know, I, I asked about that and the responses that I got were mostly about um, how what has to happen at some point is a person has to be able to learn to take some space for himself or herself to figure out what it is that they do want. Yeah, there, there needs to be a distance created sometimes. You need to right. get out of – in fact, I would say the more time that you've spent single, the better chances you have of really establishing this sense of self. Right. One of the most common threads I heard is that most people learned self-possessiveness and learned a sense of who they were through first having a relationship that was unhealthy end so that they could learn from those mistakes and learn to look out for those things in the future and build better boundaries around them. Mm -hmm. But it took going through those difficult times for them to get to that point. And some of the ones who have the clearest boundaries now were the ones who had those boundaries trampled on the most – yeah. Uh, before and that that gave them it sort of empowered them to overcome that for the next next relationship and even if that meant that they were going to take a longer time before yeah. they got to the next relationship they took the time to be by themselves and that time was when they were able to figure out who they were yeah. and that's part of our problem is we do have a system set up especially in evangelical cultures and people who live in those same areas like you and I do yeah that we live in a place where people push you to get married quickly. Yeah. They push they push you to commit as early and, and as immediately as possible so that you don't have any time as an adult to figure out who you are. I think the brain doesn't fully develop until your mid to late twenties, like this myelon sheath, you know, that comes around. Yeah, I think the top. it's your frontal lobe for the most part, but yeah, it's not fully done. You don't know who you are. High school or college. Yeah. Right. You don't, and you haven't had time to be on your own and be an adult, and that's something that's lacking. So it seems to me that what would need to happen for most people is that it's supposing they've already they already dived in to a relationship, right, yeah. and um, they are now in it. So the question is how do they learn to develop this sense of self while still in the midst of a relationship? And yeah. it seems to me that some measure of having space yeah. to be alone is necessary to figure out what that is. And the other person has to be able to afford that because – if they want a healthy relationship, that's got that space has to be made. Yeah. Because if it's not, what ends up happening is the space has to be created some other way, and it'll have to be created apart from the other person. But I right. don't know any other way for somebody who's naturally uh, slow to recognize and enforce their own boundaries to learn that without getting that space to be alone. Right. And that's just the thing is, some of us are naturally wired that way. We're we're wired to have boundaries that are too fluid. Yeah. Because. Uh, Speaking for myself, I'm, I am a strong empath. I have a tendency to adopt other people's needs and desires as my own mm-hmm. so that I forget what mine are apart from what the other person wants. Yeah. And, and when, when you relate that way, it's not, even, it's not even the other person's fault. You know, It's not like they're forcing you to, to just do whatever they want. It's, no. it's like a natural proclivity that you have already wired into yourself that you have to watch out for and guard against because the chances are the other person is not going to be the one to set up the boundary. Yeah. You know, the person is not going to be able to recognize that you are just conforming to them. Yeah. You are going to have to be the one that recognizes that your needs are not being met because you're you're basing all of your expectations from life on what other people need. Yeah. In which sense, that means that you don't really have a sense of your own identity at all apart from another person. And that yeah. has to be made. That space has to be made somehow. And it's like pay now or pay later, you know, but somehow or another, the time has to come where you take that time and, and, and make the space to figure out who you are. Yeah. I think it gets more painful the longer you wait. Absolutely. And that other person, like you said, when when one of you 
says, hey, I need some space. The other one is going to be tempted to take that personal. <laughs> and then, But in the meantime, by taking that space, you're actually giving that other person space, and they can you know, do their own self-work That's and, and self-identity. You know, maybe they'll be less inclined to pull on you uh, the yeah. way that you've uh, inclined them to. Right. The other thing you mentioned is that the impetus for finding oneself a lot of times comes from pain. Like, it gets too hot in the kitchen. This relationship got so bad. Or I watched my parents have such a bad relationship. Their their search for self and their stepping away and pursuing self was a reaction to a bad situation. And I saw literally somebody posted verbatim, like, on that thread. Uh, you They got to a place where they didn't take shit off anyone, you know. And there right. is that, I am here, and hear me roar, and I am substance. I think I've often referred to the Peter Pan thing that the that the lost boys didn't cast a shadow because the only thing that casts a shadow is something of substance and so the sun goes right through you you're you're invisible or your your yeah. needs or your will is never asked right well and the thing is yeah they're not going to be able to recognize that you're not saying what you need because if you're like me you're a person who conforms your needs to what the other person needs so you are voicing needs they just happen to correspond to what the other person wants, which works great for them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the problem is it is a dysfunctional way of relating to another person, but it's not dysfunctional in the sense of somebody else actively taking advantage of you, except that they're doing it without even knowing that they're doing it. Yeah. Because in a way, you are taking advantage of yourself and using them as the means by which you're doing it. So it's a really uh, difficult to perceive dysfunction. Yeah. Is it seems like everybody's getting what they want. If you base your understanding of your needs and hopes and wants and dreams around what the other person wants, then everyone is going to be happy up until a point because it seems like everyone's getting what they want. Yeah. And only you, somewhere inside your own head, deep down, know that you're not getting what you want, but you don't know how to recognize it because you're so accustomed to just conforming to the other person in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So what happens is over time, this resentment grows. Something unhealthy is there. And a need to break out from that yeah. grows, and you don't know what to do with it yeah. because there's not a good, healthy outlet for that. And the only thing I know to do is is for there to be space yeah. for a person to develop these sides of themselves that may or may not be directly related to the other person. Yeah. Maybe it's developing new friendships, developing a new hobby, and that would always be painful because it means taking away from time that the other person is used to having. Yeah. But I think that's necessary, and, and yeah. some kind of time alone could also help. <laughs> Well, in that scenario that you just described, sometimes the person who is quiet about their own needs, they literally kind of wish that the other person would just get it without them having to say it. In the meantime, right. the other person is going about their life and making choices based on either the, the silence of that other person or if they say something, but it may not be their own voice it may just be they're saying what they know they know the other person wants to hear mm -hmm. and so they go about doing it and like you said they're blindsided whenever it it eventually erupts into you've been abusing me you've been bullying me all these mm -hmm. years <laughs> and that person can be going what i i what? thought you know i thought we were i thought we were great. on the same page all this time Okay, so I've seen other people go through similar phases and mm -hmm. I've been on the 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 end of it where I could see uh, how hard it was for everyone else. And yeah. obviously there are always two sides to these things, but <laughs> yeah. um, some of it is, is due to pop culture. Do you remember the movie um, Look Who's Talking? No. Oh, was that the baby? Yes. Yeah. In Look Who's Talking, there's a scene where the dad uh, of the baby, the real dad. Of the John, baby, Travolta? John Travolta? No, no, he's not the real dad. He's, okay. He comes along later on. The real dad ends up divorcing the mom, uh, Kirstie Alley. Mm -hmm. and, um, and at one point, she's at his office explaining that he, she needs him, the real dad, to be there for the baby. And the guy looks at her and he responds by saying, well, you know, I've been talking with my therapist and he says I'm going through a selfish phase. And she loses her mind. She's like, a selfish phase? You're what? You know, because at that moment, what she was looking for was a father and he wasn't going to be there. You know, so that phrase got co-opted into a storyline in which a guy was being a complete ass. Yeah. You know, so I, I have this triggering <laughs> response to that statement. And that's part of my problem is I think there's something to this need, this need to figure out what it is that you need. Yeah. 
but I've been so programmed, right. not, you know, not only from church, but sometimes even from random movie references, yeah. to see that, to hear that as a snivelly sort of immature uh, man-child thing to say. And mm-hmm. yet, as soon as I say that, I'm looking at it and thinking, yes, but there's something about this. There's something about not just men, but women needing their space. And it's not just about you know, midlife crisis. It's better if it's something that's handled earlier, you know? Oh but yeah, ideally. I think a lot of us get to that point though, where we're in our forties or even in our fifties and we realize we don't even know who we are. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you can try to ignore your needs as long as you can, but somehow or another, they're going to assert themselves anyway. Yeah. And what would be better is to have the control over how those needs assert themselves by proactively figuring out who we are before that happens. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Which is what I think you're saying, just figuring out how to see what it is that we're missing and find ways to incorporate that into our lives. And I would say communicating as much as possible to the other person what those things are, which is what I suck at the most. I'm going to be completely frank with you. I do not – the reason I'm even thinking about this self-possession question is because I am not. It's because I'm not that, and yeah. I'm trying to learn how to be that, and learning how to communicate those needs to another person I'm in a relationship with is a huge lack in my life that I'm trying to learn how to do. I can be communicative about all kinds of things, but when it comes to talking to a significant other about needs, it's just a blind spot for me. Yeah. And I think that's what the way it is for a lot of people that are struggling with this. But at some point, you have to learn to communicate what those needs are as soon as you actually become aware of what they are, which might be the first problem. Yeah. Well, this is obviously really complicated, and I appreciate you talking to me. And uh you know, I, uh, good luck, right? We we're, should talk some more, and I would, I would like to touch base and find out how, how it's going for you, and I'll tell you how it's going for me. And yeah, can for sure. Out. Well, that's how we do it in community. I mean, this is the feedback that we need from each other, and, and so I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate you talking to me today. Thanks, Cass. So that's my talk with Neil Carter. You can find his blog by searching Godless in Dixie on the Pathios Network. The issue of self-possession is something many ex-Christians are having to process, and I'm here to tell you, it's hard work. My thanks to Neil for coming on and talking about this difficult issue. Next up is my interview with Trav Mamone and guest co-host Janine. Okay, so Trav, I've got a special co-host with me th- today because Bob is out of town, and uh, mm-hmm. she's just going to go by her first name because she's not entirely out, uh, <laughs> but her name's Janine. Say hi. Hi. How are you? Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. So our guest is Trav Mamone. Is that how you say your last name? Yep, that's right. I, I could have... I thought that was it, but I, you know, does anybody ever say Mamoni? <laughs> uh, a few do. In fact, I think that's the original uh, Italian way of pronouncing it, but um, uh, it got kind of got Americanized. Yeah. So you're calling from Maryland. Yep. Yep. Eastern Maryland. What's the temperature up there? I think right now it's in the 40s. Let me check my phone. It is. It's about what it is here. Yeah, it's about the same as it is here. It's 39 according to my phone. Okay. Well, today is January 28th, and so the way I've got shows backed up is that it's probably going to be five or six weeks before this is out. So we're going to talk probably today some time-sensitive things, but for the most part, not so much. And so it doesn't really matter, but I just wanted to, when we're talking the temperature, in case it's like changed in six weeks, and we'll think, well, what are we talking about? Well, let's hope it's changed in six weeks. Yeah, I hope so with the... What is it, the uh, the groundhog sees its shadow or something like that? Every year. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite movies, by the way. Groundhog Day? Yeah. Mm, that would be my idea of torture. <laughs> well, that's kind of what I – it is torture, and that's the way I see life. <laughs> I, I think this this orbit that we're in, you know, 24-hour cycle and stuff and get up and go down and do your thing and come turn around and do it again day after day. Mm-hmm. But it can be, like it was in his case, a means to – not perfect oneself because I don't like the word perfect. It's myth, right? Mm-hmm. But at least better oneself, right, Trav? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. You like that movie? <laughs> I haven't watched that movie in so long. Yeah, I forgot moldy. most of it. Yeah, uh, I'm just a Bill Murray fan. Ah, uh. oh yeah, he's amazing. All right, well, Trav, I'm. Uh, I just want to thank you again for having me on your show. Now, your your current 
uh, podcast is called the Bi Skeptical Podcast, right? Uh, well, actually, I have two uh, podcasts. The main one is By Any Means. Okay. Uh, that's a weekly show where I talk to bloggers, podcasters, activists, um, artists, scientists, and basically whoever else I find interesting, and just talk to them a little bit about their backstory. And uh, it's not so much deconversion stories, although we do get into that, but more like just we, we cover that, but also we talk a lot about, you know, what the person does. Basically, it's a way to, number one, talk to people that I really admire, give give them excuse for, for them to talk to me, yeah. and also just highlight voices within the community that sometimes you might might have heard of them. Like I've had Seth Andrews and David Silverman on, but also people who are like, up and coming uh, bloggers and podcasters. Right. So that's the main one, by any means. You did me. That's I was an up and coming podcaster at the time, and and uh, that was back in July of 2016 on episode 54. You had me on, and that's what I was getting to. Is I was grateful that you had me on, and oh, okay, cool, cool. And so the second uh, podcast I have is by Skeptical Podcast. That is more of a news commentary show that I do with uh, Morgan Stringer, who used to be on No Religion Required, but now Bobby and Ashley are just sort of doing their thing, doing mm -hmm. their own thing right now. Mm -hmm. And that one, we basically take a look at current events, and you know, not just simply say, "Oh, look what." This stupid thing Trump did this week, which we'll be doing a lot of. It's not in the next all just the low hanging fruit, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But also, what we try to do is uh, get into, try to like look at this issue from like different perspectives and whatnot. Like when the Trump tape came out, um, we did an episode on rape culture, you know, what it is and all that stuff. So that's what we, that's what we do there. Cool. All right. Well, can, um, Let's just go back to the beginning and get your backstory and like the religious context of your upbringing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I was raised what I like to call a wedding and funeral Christian. My family didn't really go to church unless someone was either getting married or buried. Um, you know, I always had a fascination with religion and spirituality. Like, I did have, like, one of those, you know, kid Bibles, although I base I didn't read the entire thing, just the stories that I was interested in, which I think a lot of Christians do growing up. <laughs> right. But um, then I got more into Wicca in high school paganism because, well, number one, I was like a sort of a goth kid back in the day, and it seemed like paganism was like, you know, the religion for goth kids to be so into. But, how old are you? Uh, 33. I'm going to be 34 and at the end of April, even though I don't look a day over 23. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I was just trying to place, you know, what, what uh, you know, the high school context back, you know, because... Yeah. So you would have you graduated from high school what year? Two thousand one. Yeah. How big was your graduating class? I think we had like two thousand kids graduating with us. Okay, big school though. Yeah, yeah, definitely. In fact, overcrowded. So we're gonna get into your orientation, let's say sexual orientation and gender <laughs> identification stuff. And I, I while we're talking about your high school years, I think we'll just insert that here as far as how you identify and at what age did you begin to realize things. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's it's all pretty connected. I don't know. There's so many like different chapters in the story. I forget which order they go in when I talk to people. Yeah. Um, I identify as bisexual and genderqueer, or sometimes I say a non-binary trans person. Now, when it comes to sexuality, basically... Even though a lot of people say, you know, bi means two, and so if you're attracted to anyone of any gender, you should say pansexual because it's more inclusive. But um, I, I prefer bisexual because more people are familiar with it, you know, whereas pansexual, you have to explain it over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, it's just easier. And right. I'm glad definitely. you said that because when I was looking at the um, terminology you were using, it seemed to me there was a disconnect between bisexual and genderqueer. And so when you're saying it's more pansexual, but you use the terminology people are familiar with, that makes more sense to me. Yeah, definitely. And as far as my gender identity, um, I identify as, you know, a genderqueer slash non-binary, which basically means that, you know, I 
don't see myself as either 100% man or 100% woman. I mean, if you if, if you were to look at me naked, you would definitely say, yep, you're a man. But um, as far as the way I see myself, man doesn't fit me and neither does woman. Basically, I kind of always felt like I was in the middle of the gender spectrum ever since I was little, but I didn't know there was a word for it until like just a couple years ago. Although I did kind of know something was different about me. I realized I was bisexual in high school, but I didn't really tell anybody because it was kind of, I don't know, my sexuality is sort of, it's all wibbly wobbly. Like, (laughs) it'd be like, you know, oh man, women are so gorgeous. Yet, I kind of want to make out with my friend Anthony. What is going on here? And plus also at the time, most of the language surrounding LGBT issues was just focused on, you know, gay people and so i was like well gee i don't know if i'm really queer enough to come out as uh bi like if i start if i start dating a woman does that automatically make you straight (laughs) right right or cancel out my queer card you know did you date at all in high school yeah yeah in fact this is quite interesting and part of my spiritual journey so like all my life i struggled with mental health problems like ever since i was a kid i had a hard time dealing with my emotions like whenever i would get bullied in school i would um react by you know smacking myself in the head and yelling and screaming i've been to therapy quite a number of times in high school it got to the point where i was basically looking for something to you know ease the pain and so In my senior year, I started dating this uh, girl who was a Christian. At the time, I was still a uh, a Wiccan, a pagan. I wasn't really into religion. You know, I was listening to, like, Marilyn Manson and, like, writing God is Dead and drawing, like, little upside-down pentagrams all over my notebook and all that stuff. (laughs) You were demon-possessed, basically. I was just a goth kid. And um, Mm -hmm. so anyways, me and this girl, we would talk, and she talked about Jesus in a way that was a lot different than... I, see, I grew up with uh, my dad. My dad basically bailed out on me and my mom when I was like mm, almost a year old. I mean, I saw him, you know, periodically throughout my childhood, but never really had that close relationship. And so my then girlfriend told me that, um, you know, God was like a father to the fatherless. And so, you know, at the time, I thought that, you know, God was speaking to me. You know, God was catching up to me and saying, I love you, come home to me, son. But at, now I just look back and realize, oh, somebody just said the, the right words at the right time. So, yeah, when I was 17, I became a uh, born-again Christian, to the shock of everyone. <laughs> Even your goth friends, or especially your goth friends, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> You're a traitor at that point, actually. Well, th- actually, they didn't really, like, reject me. They just said, okay, if that's what makes you happy, do it. Just don't just don't preach at us. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I can do that, you know. Goth kids are the, some of the least judgmental because they feel so judged. They don't, you know, they don't like how it feels, and so they do unto others. That's, that's my experience. Yeah, for the most part, although I was kind of judgmental when I was, you know, back in the day because I was, I don't know, I always had this feeling of intense alienation, and so I was like, I always thought, okay, well, there's something wrong with you, society, you know, you all, you're all from a perfect world that threw me away, and so fuck you all, and that sort of thing, so yeah, I was a little bit of a judgmental dick back in the day, I can still be sometimes. Yeah, well, that was your that was your coping mechanism, or at least your survival mechanism. But instead of hating yourself, you know, which you obviously can't sustain that for very long, you turned it on them. Mm-hmm. All right, so you're you're uh, high school. You go. You date this uh, born again girl. You get uh, you get Jesus, and and I know that uh, that father hole. Now you said he left when you were were very young, but then you ended up with him. We've patched things up, and so we're Facebook friends. Um, He lives in Portland, Oregon right now, so we don't really see each other a lot. But, you know, we we talk, and so things are cool between us. My dad's, like, a really interesting person. He's, like, total 
punk rocker you know <laughs> like he basically is like once once punk rock hit in the 70s he was just went all in for it you know and he dressed up like he was in a band even though he's never was in a band and lived the whole sex drugs rock and roll lifestyle uh then he kind of calmed down a little bit once he had my half sister uh jet who is i think 14 or 15 now mm-hmm. what about your mom we're, we're pretty cool. Um, I don't really live with her. Basically, what we, uh, my mom and my stepdad, who I get along with, you know, we're cool. Um, they recently bought this uh, little house. Well, not a little house. It, it's, it's a house that they made one section of the house into a studio apartment for me. So technically, I'm kind of on my own, but also kind of not at the same time. It, it's a it's a weird thing. But hey, I, I have a lot more independence than I used to. So that's a good thing. I got my own um, I got my own sink, my own uh, stovetop, my own fridge, and also my own bathroom. That's important. <laughs> yes. So I was I want to go back to your dad for a second. He's has he got a lot of tattoos? Oh yes, definitely. And uh he's embraced you though. Like he knows how, how much like how much does he know about you know your identification even as an atheist or gender queer or all the above? Oh, he's a hardcore atheist himself. And okay. so when when I left religion, he was like, "That's my boy. I'm so <laughs> proud of you. I knew you eventually see the light." Yeah. And what about your mom? Does she know? And is she religious? She is, and she does know, and she's totally cool with it. She's always been a very liberal Christian. Um, mm-hmm. It's only been in the past couple of years that, you know, she and my stepdad have really been active in church, mostly because their parents, you know, my maternal grandparents and also my step-grandmother, they've all basically passed away within the past four years, and so they've sort of gravitated more towards church Basically, as a coping, basically for yeah. healing, you know, yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, being in a community of people and really uh, volunteering, it really helps. It helps the process, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's it, it is an opiate. So, and the loss of parents. I mean, it, there's something. You know, my father died when I was 17, but and my mom's still alive. But I already can tell that when she leaves, it's like there's no on the what is it, the family tree. There's no tear. Above me, like I'm, I'm the top of the tier as far as living, you know, genealogical line here, and that's that's. Have you ever, do you have both your parents? Still both alive? of my parents have died, and uh-huh. so I am the oldest. Okay, on my so side how did family. I mean when that first happened? I mean, what were you feeling? Kind of um, like a boat that had lost its mooring. Yeah, that a it, boat that has lost its mooring. Great. Um, there was. Th- this freedom, but there was also this terrifying freedom yeah. and this feeling of I didn't ask enough questions when they were alive. Okay, but, um, yeah. There's that song. I think it's it's not Mister Mister, but the Living Years. Mm-hmm. Uh, God, I can't remember the name of that band. But that song just strikes me. It's just like because we do you know miss miss out on some stuff because we're afraid or mm-hmm. we're cowardly or whatever about it. And it's like when they die, you're going, oh man, I wish I'd have been more bold or more brave to. Yeah to engage them anyway that's a little tangent but is that the one featuring um uh tony banks from uh oh no not tony banks mike Ruck- rutherford from yeah. uh, genesis yeah. when we die that's it. Da, yeah. Da, and they have that choir singing. yeah yeah i forgot who sings it but i know the song mike and the mechanics that's it that's it i was a big fan and still am you know i mean as far as that song speaking of music what kind of music you listen to my musical tastes sort of run a gamut. Like, I basically, I like to say everything, like, from, like, Beatles to Bach to uh, David Bowie to a lot of the... B word. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I like a lot of huh? non-B word bands yeah. as well. Like, like uh, I actually am a huge fan of uh, Todd Rundgren. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, I used to have, like, really bad anxiety during high school and for some reason uh todd's something anything album really eased the anxiety i don't know why maybe it has something to do with the chords and the melodies or whatnot i'm not a musicologist so i don't know but there's something about that yeah yeah so you you get jesus through this girlfriend how long did that last and like how you know how did you pray every day did you read the bible how devoted were you 
Oh, I bought it hook, line, and sinker, okay. definitely. Like I said, I was looking for something to help ease the pain, and when I thought I found it, I like jumped into it head first. Right. I was basically swimming in the water. I drank all the Kool Aid. <laughs> Yeah, I went to like church every day. I prayed. I read the Bible. Although I should point out that even then, I kind of knew there were some things about it that just didn't make sense. Like when I became born again, I didn't just, you know, do what I did in the past and just read the Bible stories that I wanted to read. No, I read the entire thing. And so I saw the red flags right from the beginning. You know, a lot of people say, well, I read the Bible and that's why I'm an atheist. But for me, it was sort of like getting into a relationship you know you shouldn't be in, <laughs> seeing red flags from the beginning, but writing them off. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like I came across a passage in Numbers where, like, there was a guy picking up sticks on the Sabbath and God says, kill him. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that seems a little bit... Um, that, that escalated quickly, didn't it? Yeah. And then all the stuff about, you know, the homosexuality and, and whatnot, because I was like, well, gee, they're not really hurting anybody, so why should that be such a bad thing? And, you know, just a bunch of other stuff. But like I said, I sort of wrote it off like, oh, God was having a bad day, you know? Yeah. I love this metaphor, though, that you just presented. So, like, if, when a girl or a guy is dating somebody, and they're getting to know each other, and let's say that she gets in the car and she sees that he's a road rager or whatever. Or I remember uh, when we were young, I uh, my wife just reminded me of it recently, but I used to be a dick to, to waiters and waitresses. Oh. And I can't remember that guy because now, I mean, I, I well, for one thing, it surprises me because when I was about 16, I, I waited tables myself. So I'm <laughs> not sure. I, I don't have any recollection of that. But anyway, this would be an indication for her or, or whoever's dating the road rager to kind of go, red flag, you know, this might be somebody that I don't want to be with in the long term. And this is how you were feeling about dating God here. You know, you're reading the Bible, right. you're seeing parts of the Bible where he's brutal or maniacal or whatever, and uh, you were already like little pockets of, of doubt and, and suspicion. Trav, at any point, did you deny who you were? Uh, queer? Oh, you mean uh, mm -hmm. pretend I was straight? Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, is that, you know, really coming into my identity was a process for me because like I said earlier in high school I was like kind of confused that you know I still like women so I guess I'm not really queer so I basically kind of just like didn't really think about it during those times um I could see where it would be hard to think about and mm -hmm. like especially in light of the Christian message that there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And the reason that that, that you were you, f you found the, the fact that you were attracted to women at the same time almost as a saving grace for yourself because it's like, well, yeah, there's a part of me that is that is fucked up. Uh, but at least I'm still attracted to women, so that part of me is righteous in God's eyes or whatever. All this all this uh, yeah. gymnastics can go go on in your head. Right, right, exactly, exactly, definitely. It's interesting. I have a daughter who's exactly your age, graduated the same year, and uh, we were extremely religious, and she was leaving faith at the same time you were finding it. And so I'm listening to you and how you dealt with high school, um, thinking of the exact opposite going on in our home and the dis discord that created. Um, did you have any stress from your mom? about being overly religious? No, not really. The, um, she was like, she was always supportive. She just said, you know, whatever you do, don't don't be a Republican. You know, don't be <laughs> one of these fundamentalist, right-winged asshole Republicans who are trying to overturn Roe v. Wade or prevent uh, same-sex couples from marrying. Don't do that. <laughs> That's funny because, you know, you're not a true Christian unless you are a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and pro-life. Yeah. Well, we don't want to get it. Man, I tell you, uh, 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 what are you feeling, Trav, in view of this new administration? I know that I, as a white, straight male, uh, I have a whole lot less to lose by some of the uh, 
legislations that might be coming down the pike. But uh, what are you what are you feeling? Basically, going back and forth between uh, hope and despair. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I have both experience both at the same time. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's like, a weird feeling, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, because, you know, the pessimism side says, you know, it's all over, 1984 is here today, Big Brother's watching you, one day they're going to take me to room 101 where they're going to torture me until I until I declare my love for Big Brother. But on the other hand, I'm like, well, no, because as Mr. Rogers famously said, look for the helpers, and, you know, we, we see this growing resistance towards uh, Trump, and so... You know, that's 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 got to be a good sign. Right. And so I don't know. I'm basically at this point still trying to figure out what I can do to assist the resistance. Like right now, basically, all I'm doing is just making calls to my local representative. In fact, I I kind of have them on speed dial now. And I'm pretty (laughs) sure the interns at his office are sick of hearing me. In fact, I'm pretty sure that one day I'm going to call and say, hi, my name is Trav Amon and I'm a constituent from Eastern Maryland. And they're going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you want now? No, but that's good. Squeaky wheel. Yeah, my fear is that it seems that the pathway to communicating with our, our, the word I'm looking for, it's just escaped me. Our representatives um, Mm -hmm. is being shut down. Um, You know, the line to the White House is shut down. You can't talk to anybody. I mean, Paul Ryan's line is just not answering anything. So um, do you ever fear that that's going to happen with you, with your ability to speak out? Yeah, I do sometimes. I mean, I try not to let anxiety take over because then I would be basically a paranoid alcoholic who never leaves their house. (laughs) But No, I understand. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But um, you know what? Actually, I just saw a couple of videos that two different friends posted on uh, Facebook. One of them was a video by a retired uh, congressman who said, nowadays... You know, you got to, like, cause a ruckus at a town hall meeting because the Tea Party did that back in their heyday, and now we've got Trump, and so that's how you get people's attention. And then another person posted a video from a recent town hall meeting where a black man is condemning all the representatives, saying, you know, Philando's blood is on your hands, Philando Castile, um, you know, who got shot last year. year flannel's blood is on your hands shame on you you don't represent us and you should leave now because you know we're not going to vote for you next time and there was like a huge crowd behind him both white and black you know cheering him and chanting uh behind him and clapping their hands and so i'm thinking ah so that's how you do it nowadays <laughs> mm. duly noted <laughs> did you take place in the march no, I didn't. I wanted to go to the Women's March, but unfortunately, I realized how large it was going to be, and social anxiety said, nope, nope, uh, nope, nope, okay. nope, nope, nope. I think a lot of people felt that way, fear of crowds, fear of uh, the response, and just fear of being around too many people where they couldn't get out. So Right. My definitely. wife was afraid of getting shot by some Trump, you know, mm-hmm. redneck. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's true. She, Without the she, fear, I think it would have been twice as much. It, many people showing up. I know that much. Biggest protest, a uh, peaceful protest in the history of the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Turns mm-hmm. out. Right. Yeah, definitely. And uh, another the reason why I decided not to go is because you know the day before the women's march, you know, we saw like the group of anarchists smashing stuff in mm-hmm. D.C. And so I was like, oh god, are they going to show up again and fuck everything up? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a real fear. Yeah. So, Trav, I'm going to jump into something that, uh, again, this is maybe the most time-sensitive thing I'm going to say on the show, but um, the most recent episode at the time of this taping of Sam Harris's podcast, Waking Up, yeah. is, um, is his episode 62. It aired January 21st, and it's called What is True? And at the beginning of that, his guest is Jordan Peterson, a psychologist, and they're basically talking about a some some laws that were being passed in in Canada regarding hate speech and uh, gender pronouns. So I guess I meant to ask you this up front, but what what pronouns do you prefer? Uh, I prefer they them pronouns. Okay. So Jordan Pearson can kiss my queer ass. <laughs> 
Yeah, that fuck was... Uh, Sam Harris, fuck you, Jordan Pearson, fuck you, Dave Rubin, and fuck all of you uh, free speech warriors who are too too busy coddling uh, the alt-right to actually speak out against it. So there you go. I, God, that felt good to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it sounded good, too. Yeah, no, but this is a big deal, and uh, it's certainly dividing the atheist community. I saw, I mean, what roused me, I listen to Sam's podcast fairly regularly anyway, but I saw on my newsfeed some atheist friend of mine said he'd never been more ashamed of Sam Harris than he was, you know, in that episode. And the only thing I keep in mind, not the only thing, but one of the main things that I, that I watch for Whenever I'm up against a, an issue that is divisive and controversial and very complicated and nuanced, I kind of look for things. One, I follow the money if there's something like that. You know, what's to be gained from a certain this or that position? In this case, there's no money to be gained. So I look for the privilege. <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, Dave Rubin, Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, they're all white males. They're all white straight yeah. males. Mm-hmm. Um, well, actually, Dave Rubin's gay. Is he? Yeah, yeah, he oh, has a husband. Oh, that changes everything then for me. Right. Because I, I, I follow him on Twitter, and I can obviously see his, his bent uh, against SJWs, you know, social justice warriors. And uh, all right, so I've done this. I've said this on the show before. I'm, I like the tough-skinnedness of people being uh, not so sensitive. But again, I'm a white straight male talking, so I understand that that's a privilege that I, I'm able to say, you know, all oh, you guys need to toughen up. I hear that side, I'm, and simultaneously on that side, I'm a huge proponent of free speech. Everybody ought to be able to say whatever they want. Um, but when, it, when the words become weaponized, we obviously socially don't let people say the N-word. Uh, we can get into, you know, those kind of things. And when people are getting hurt... I don't know. I mean, I just wonder if it's I don't know if it's if it's the government's place to get involved there. I don't know. I, what do you what do you think, Janine? Um I'm I'm against the government getting involved in any language used because that becomes a violation of the free speech and it really depends on what side they're on, whether or not they're going to come down on Christians or anti-Christians or atheists or gays or whatever. I think it's really just a matter of common sense and politeness to respect people for who they are and what they want to be called. Right. And so if they if they breach that and they they become mean and indecent and disrespectful, then uh, should they be prosecuted for some kind of crime, a hate crime? I think only if they're in a public servant kind of role. If okay. they're one of our uh, elected officials or they're one of the people who work for the government, then absolutely they they don't have a right to do that on their own on their work time or in their representation. Yeah. If they're doing it in their own home, absolutely not. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't want anybody to be silenced, but I don't want my government to support anything that's going to hurt anybody. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Trav? Well, actually, this is one of those complicated, nuanced issues. Let me just say, basically, I fucking hate Milo Yiannopoulos. You know, I mm. fucking hate him with all my heart. Do I want the government to step in to Censor have him, him banned? Right. The censor him from speaking at colleges? No. Do I think colleges should automatically let Milo speak at their campuses? No, because it's one thing to spout off a shitty opinion. There's an, It's another thing altogether to go into a college, broadcast a picture of a transgender student and say, ha ha, look at this man in a dress trying to access women's bathrooms. It's like two minute hate from 1984. Now, once again, I wouldn't want the government stepping in, but whenever Milo speaks at a campus, I automatically show them, I want to like show people that article and say, you want this? You want this on your campus? You really want to make life hell for uh, trans students? You know? Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. Hopefully that makes sense and doesn't make me sound like a, no. you know, double speak. No, it's not double speak at all. You're, there's a difference between private beliefs and inciting hatred. Um, yes, inciting hatred. Yes. Yeah. So that's Definitely. what the difference is. The, the positive I see in that is it normalizes gays as some are jerks like Milo right. and some are nice people, which then mm-hmm. takes away the whole idea of gender construct or a- affiliation as anything important to fight against. I mean, mm-hmm. they're just people 
who happen right. to be just some are good and some aren't so good. Well, I want to say that in light of this thing that happened recently, where this uh, this Nazi guy was being filmed uh, oh, by a camera yes. crew, and a black man came up and cold cocked him, and you mm-hmm. know, and it was caught on film, and a lot of people celebrated that. But I really appreciated No Illusions uh, rant on his podcast about that, where he said, "Look, the guy was opening his mouth and talking about Nazism." That's the best thing that we can do is let the man talk because the more he talks, the more at least sensible people are going to go, oh, my God, Mm -hmm. this guy's an idiot. This guy's evil. This guy's, you know, mean and rude and uncivilized or whatever. And they're going to distance themselves from him, whereas cold cocking him, you know, actually shut him up. And made him a victim. Yeah, I made him a victim. So I, I you know, I, I think that's kind of what we're saying as far as, you know, the reason that we hate Milo is because we've heard him talk. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> right. So there's, there is some benefit at least to letting these people spew because they open their mouth and now we know who you are. Right. I should point out one thing. I think it was actually one of the uh, white anarchists that punched uh, Spencer out and not one of the Black Lives Matter protesters okay. in fact i think a lot of um uh black people during when the anarchists were busting shit up they were saying oh watch the mainstream media they're gonna blame this all on black people nowadays which is actually kind of what happened yeah. mm-hmm. and uh you know what i actually i don't feel at all sorry for richard spencer mm-hmm. at all i'm not right. gonna That's say say boo-hoo he got punched in the face i don't give a fuck but um, I also see where Noah was saying about how, you know, making, uh, you know, Richard Spencer the victim, mm-hmm. you know, yes. it's basically inciting more hatred towards us. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I actually, I don't know how much I should say, but there was a huge public falling out between two of my friends mm-hmm on facebook over this issue and these aren't just like a couple of private individuals no, no 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 one of them is you know a big time podcaster and the other one is a blogger on the patheos network and it got so ugly they basically just had this big public falling out mm-hmm. and i actually wrote a uh, parody blog post you know, making fun of the whole thing where I said, I've, you know, there's a lot of controversy in the atheist community. And so I've decided the hill I'm going to stand on and I will defend this belief to the death. I like pineapples on my pizza. And so I just, as it was basically meant to be Mm lighthearted. So I I can't talk to you anymore. If you like pineapples on your pizza, I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Blasphemer. I'm I'm going to defend, defriend you. So, so we can take this out, but uh, was it GS Spellchecker and Dan Errol? Uh, well, I was actually, th- well, actually, I was thinking it was uh, David Smalley and Dan Errol. Oh yeah, they had one too. But I know that, uh-huh. yeah, Dan's a little feisty. <laughs> oh yeah, he is like total like Marxist, you know, ready to you know fight the good fight. You know, whereas David, he's a little bit more on the liberal side. I mean, I'm not trying to. I don't want to pick a team or anything like no, that. I, there's so much watch. division. Yeah. There, there, it's so much division. That I don't want to get part of it. And plus, also, I internalize so much drama on the internet that it basically makes me literally sick. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I just decide to just stay out of it yeah. altogether. I'm too busy trying to figure out what I'm going to do to resist the Trump regime. I'm not I I don't care about what everyone else is doing, mm-hmm. you know, if whether yeah. you want to punch Nazis or not, or talk to Nazis, you do you, I'll do me. I love that theory. <laughs> That's my favorite philosophy is you do you. Live and let live, live and let die. Right. So Going back to the bathroom thing that was brought up, um, what bathroom do you use, and have you ever run into trouble, or you know, what's what's up there? Um, well, I basically prefer gender neutral bathrooms sure. because, I mean, people still read me as a guy, and so I'm pretty sure that it's a little bit safer for me to use a, a men's room. However, being that I do wear eyeliner. And eyeshadow and lip gloss, and sometimes I paint my nails. I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of people looking at me funny, you know. So mm-hmm. I prefer gender neutral, single stall. I do my business and get out. Right. Mm-hmm. I've seen a lot more of that in restaurants lately. I went to a restaurant last night where it, it used to be under new management, 
and you go kind of down the back hall of these narrow mm -hmm. you know storefront restaurants and they get you know the bathrooms are kind of back there behind the kitchen and the former ownership they were male and female and it's since changed management and last night we went and ate there and they're both gender neutral yeah, so you can do that if they were only single stalls the restaurants that have multiple stalls it becomes problematic yeah yeah it's just a it's a one holer yeah 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 i think the whole idea um <laughs> it's funny because the push towards male and female was supposed to provide more access back in the 70s it, it used to be just one you know in a silly little restaurant and now we're fighting against that going back to the other really there used to just be one restroom, and then they... There were people who were made to redo the whole back of the restaurant to put in large enough bathrooms to be for male and female with handicapped access. Mm -hmm. And the emphasis was on the handicapped access. Oh, yeah. But they also were required to put in two bathrooms. So it becomes a kind of funny when I can look back on the changes and the why we do the changes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think handicapped access is just as important as... Um, not singling out gays or anybody else for what bathroom they use for yeah. me it's a case of are you behaving when you're in the bathroom <laughs> if you're doing something <laughs> illegal then i don't care whether you're male or female get the f out but you know in terms yeah. of what you wear or what you look like i don't care or how you identify <laughs> or what you're attracted to or whatever yeah all right so travel let me ask you another kind of a, a social science question is gender a social construct Ah, now, here's where it gets tricky. <laughs> it's sort of, it's actually kind of a both and question. It's not really either there or. In fact, I'm actually going to be speaking at this year's American Humanist Association conference in South Carolina all about non-binary genders. And one of the things I will discuss is this particular issue. So, here's what I mean when I say it's a both and and not either or. Now, let me just say that for, before you get uh -huh. started, the, the other, the both of the other is biological. So, like, one would argue right. gender is biological, 100%. Uh, the other would say gender is a social construct, 100%. And you're saying both and. Uh, those are the poles. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Now, okay, when I say that, you know, the biological part is true basically what i mean is this i don't mean necessarily you know penis equals boy you know if you're, you got xy chromosomes you'll forever be a boy even if you're a trans woman no no no, no. but that's not true because i know plenty of uh, trans women in fact studies do show that there is a neurological component a neurological basis to gender identity mm -hmm. i think the Studies show, like, they did these brain scans on, you know, cisgender men and women and also transgender men and women. And they found that the trans women's sort of brain patterns are more similar to cisgender women's brain patterns than cisgender men's, even though the trans women and the cis men were both born with, you know, quote unquote, the same equipment. Mm -hmm. And so there is a scientific basis for gender identity. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say it, it's also a social construct, it's be mostly I'm talking about the way we think about gender because gender is such a big, it encompasses so many things, you know, it not just identity, but also roles, presentation, stereotypes, that sort of thing. And a lot of the more social aspects of gender are ideas about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. Those come from – that's a social construct. Like uh, one of my friends, a uh, former Promoting Secular Feminism co-host Amanda Wright once – said, uh, my vagina does not dictate whether or not I choose to shave my legs, you know? Yeah. And yet, that's become sort of a cultural norm. When we think womanhood, we think, you know, smooth, shaved legs, you know. Shaved armpits. Right. We, we equate body hair with masculinity, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. automatically, even though, you know, that doesn't really have anything to do with anything so hopefully that makes sense it's a lot it's very well, complicated i could probably do like an entire dissertation and <laughs> right. and presentation on it <laughs> well yeah it's just we get blue gifts for boy babies and pink gifts or you know wrapping mm -hmm. paper you know because uh, those are social constructs for sure my theory mm -hmm. is the biological component we don't know it all right we didn't know about dna until the 50s we didn't know about 
XY chromosomes until recently. We didn't know about uh, T cells and you know all of those things that are becoming normal conversational pieces within our lexicon. But there's something out there that's different and it, it affects people and it's part of the biology of who they are. And when we find it, we're gonna go, aha. I, that's what I really believe is, is that we're looking at the externals when there's so much more going on in the internals mm -hmm. for biology. Right. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, I do want to bring up one more thing about the biological basis for gender identity. Now, I've been sort of banging it out with uh, this one particular friend of mine who's a trans woman and a total scientific skeptic. She, when I say scientific skeptic, I mean she uses a scientific method to find out what's true. Not, not that she's skeptical mm -hmm. of science. Yeah, mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying. That. Yeah, I was going to say that's yes, going to be yeah, misunderstood. <laughs> We kind of bang it out every once in a while because she's not totally convinced that, you know, non-binary belongs under the transgender umbrella, mostly because at this point there's not a lot of scientific literature about non-binary gender identities. There, the only thing that I found was a survey in 2012 – and I think uh, Modern Hypotheses, I think it's called, where they surveyed a number of people who identify as bi-gender. That's sort of under the um, non-binary umbrella. Mm -hmm. Like, they found that the people who participate in the survey, you know, say that their, base, their sense of who they are gender-wise, you know, switches involuntarily, you know, sporadically. Sometimes it's weekly, sometimes it's monthly, yearly, blah, 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 you know. And a lot of them also say they kind of have phantom body parts too. So basically the article concludes that maybe, just maybe, there's a neurological basis for, you know, gender fluidity, but they're still not sure yet. So looking at the scientific basis for, you know, binary transgender uh, people's identities, um, I like to think, maybe maybe there is a biological i mean biological slash neurological um you know basis for non-binary identities but we're not sure yet mm -hmm. do we need to be sure though what is the harm in just letting people be who they are mm -hmm. right yeah well my friend kind of thinks that a lot of the whole non-binary thing is number one a fad and basically just people um you know appropriating trans language just to make themselves hip and cool right. you know mm -hmm. and it, people won't take trans people seriously uh. but i'm thinking dude bigots are going to be biggest mm -hmm. you think bigots really care about science and facts mm -hmm. no they don't they'll use anything to back up their own bullshit ideas you know, bigots haven't even ex accepted the binary evidence of gay and lesbian, never mind the rest of it. So why are we worrying about what they think about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Well, because they, they're running the government right now. Uh, yep, that, that's much. true. <laughs> that's true. So one thing that I kind of started to head down and then didn't finish was there's a, there seems to be a lot of new pronouns out there, like Zim and Zer. Uh, what, do you uh -huh. think, what do you think of those? Well... I prefer using they, them only because it's more uh, the the English language uh, recognizes that it, it's more commonplace rather than, you know, Z here and, and all that stuff. I mean, whatever pronouns you use is, is fine. I don't care. Yeah, it's, it, it's not asking the, the entire population to change the parlance of, of our vocabulary. Right. So, yeah, it's the more moderate meet in the middle type thing. <clears throat> so... Um, but then also uh, something that you guys were just talking about as far as what bigots feel and you know what they say and and I know so Janine is a what you're a licensed therapist what is your licensing I actually am not currently licensed and working towards licensure so I have an MA in therapy okay yeah but you're, you're a therapist mm -hmm. and I just recently got diagnosed at age 50 with depression mm -hmm. and um, I think there's times where it's painful for me like even when I, I had to get off work for three days to do some therapy, and um, I felt like my coworker was kind of being judgmental mm -hmm. of like, well, you're just using this as an excuse to get off work. And like, Trev, you're kind of saying that some people say, well, you're just using this these hip terms to bring attention to yourself and to look cool and to be hip. And that's offensive. 
Um, right. These are very complicated things that are going on in my head, and I wish they weren't true. I wish that I wasn't depressed. I wish I could be as happy as you. I wish that I wasn't a melancholy person. I'm not enjoying a goddamn bit of this. And fuck you for judging me for thinking I'm actually doing this willfully and volitionally to bring attention to myself. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm just saying that when the world says you're just faking it or you're just using it to be cool, fuck, that hurts. Uh-huh. Exactly. I like your perspective, Trav, um, on using the they, them, because it involves some inclusiveness um, in terms of bringing people closer to you, le letting them be comfortable around you with the pronouns, but accepting who you are. And that kind of makes it normalized for the rest of the people. And the more we can see that, then in, in a private conversation, you can have discussions about the details of your personality, much like mm -hmm. making a friend. You take the external first and you just sort of accept them and then you get to know them a little bit deeper and you know more about them, but they're not going to share that in the public arena. Mm -hmm. So unlike you, you're pretty open about things, but most people want to be close to someone before they share all this information. And right. if we use the pronouns, we're respecting the person, but we're also not allowing them to come into us because we're using that as a, a definer. Anything that creates a wall between people who are different, who are trying to be seen, is a little bit problematic. And yet, I don't want to cut off your choice of what you want to be. I'm just saying that it seems easier if initially you accept the they, them as identifying you, which you have done. It allows people to not be put off. Is that right. why you do it? Or is it more just a case of uh, you know, ease of communication? Both. Both. Really. Because, you know, using they, them pronouns for me does sort of validate my identity. But on the other hand, too, instead of, you know, using they, them instead of Z here or or all of those, it, it, it just makes it easier, you know? Mm -hmm. Although sometimes I do get into arguments with people, you know, say, you know, they is plural, you know? But I'm like, well, actually, um, NPR had a pretty good um, article not too long ago about how the uh, singular they has a long history mm -hmm. you know and f in fact i think it was pretty much used commonly until like victorian era yep. uh mm -hmm. grammar grammar people said you know use he as the dominant pronoun but then uh during the 70s the second wave feminist said well no because by using he as the all-inclusive pronoun you're basically still putting masculinity manhood as the norm mm -hmm. and so or at least the superior right right so let's do he or she well no that gets kind of uh you don't know that gets to be a mouthful after a while the singular they okay oh, you let's mean he slash she yeah. yeah 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 it's similar to when MS was introduced as Ms. And instead of Mrs. or Miss, there was a mm -hmm. huge backlash. I, I was part of that generation where it was introduced. And I remember sermons against it. Um, it was so shocking. And yet nowadays people don't even notice it. So let me, right. so let me get some clarification on that because that's, that's a fascinating thing. And I don't, I don't remember that in history. So Mr. and Mrs. MRS... Mm -hmm. was the standard and especially of the patriarchal society mm -hmm. because you didn't you actually so my mom was dorothy midgley and yet she was known as mrs frank midgley right ownership by a man well not only by last name no i mean that's bad enough that yeah. you that you're actually having to forfeit your identity your background your uniqueness to to get absorbed into his last name but that mrs stuff is actually you're getting rid of your first name too. I mean, obviously in in social circles, people are going to still call you Dorothy, mm -hmm. but on a, an official mail like or official terminology, it was Mrs. Frank Midgley. Yep. And and so what you're saying is you were a part of you were alive when there was a movement to be able to call her Mrs. Dorothy or or M S. I thought M S was if you were single. No, um, basically, if you're a man, you're a Mister, mm -hmm. whether you're married or not. Right. If you're a woman, you were Miss when you weren't married. Miss, M S. M no, M I S S. M I S S. Miss and your pre first pre married. Pre married, first name, last name, and then when you became married, you were Mrs. His name, last name. Yeah. 
the change to MS was if Mr. can denote unmarried and married, then Ms. can denote unmarried and married women, and they can use their own name. That was So my mom could have used Miss Dorothy Midgley and still be married to Frank. No, Ms., not Miss, Ms. Ms., okay, the Z sound. Yeah. But and, it's still MS period, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, but Miss is not abbreviated MS period. Never it's was. a totally different thing. Totally different thing. Okay, anyway, this is a tangent, but I'm fascinated by this stuff because Mindy and I are starting to realize that as we've been together for 34 years, there's a lot of there's a lot of shit left over in our old school Christian patriarchal mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. construct, social construct of marriage that is bullshit, and yet we it's the water we've been swimming in, and we both want to, you know, bring that, you know, into the 21st century. And into two autonomous, independent agents that mm-hmm. just respect each other's uniqueness and drive and all of that. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, I think I've said it enough on the show where people are, are figuring out that I'm in the midst of some some heavy lifting when it comes to reforming what what it means to be, uh, you know, married mm-hmm. to my wife of 30 years in a way that is void of you know where we've just like in we deconstructed christianity we deconstructed all kinds of narratives and social constructs we're trying to deconstruct and reconstruct something that is closer to reality and truth and mutual respect there's also this sense of i, I want to fit in with my my social setting so i use the terminology that they use because it's, it's understood well but how does that work for somebody like trav i mean <laughs> that well that's the problem is because everybody wants to fit in and know where everybody stands, when gays and trans and whoever out there identify differently with different terminology, that is frightening to the people who don't fit in. Well, yeah, I think that people are pissed because people like Trav are coming along and throwing, they're messing things up. We had this figured out, Trav. It was two buckets, male and female, straight and gay, or no, not not straight and gay, just um, that you were attracted to the opposite sex. You guys, Trav, you guys are fucking up society. You're messing Woo-hoo! it all up. <laughs> you're you're making this complicated. You're making me have to think. You're making me have to maybe uh, worry about if I'm going to hurt somebody by using wrong language. I just wish you'd go away. We're going to create an island, and we're going to ship all you queers to an island so we can get back to making America great again. <laughs> can we? Uh, can we have liquor? <laughs> On this sure. island, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> Con- and some condoms. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you let us visit, though. Well, I don't know if you're gonna kick us out. We might not let you back mm. in. Be like, hey, it's going fine. We're not getting killed anymore. Yeah. Good point. It's a good point because that <laughs> that difference makes you a, a target. Uh, eventually, everybody would want to live on that island. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the more we. M- weed out people that are different the more other differences show up and there's always going to be somebody who is targeted as the other and Mm -hmm. and that's the thing we're fighting against so much well it's if you're insecure there's always going to be an other for you to to feel superior to well people are generally insecure which is why i have work (laughs) (laughs) that's why you have job security yeah i totally i would i would uh, drink to that I'm, i'm deeply insecure and and uh much more than i thought i was and and, uh, Here's a little known secret: yeah. even therapists can be insecure. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right, Trav. So let's wrap this up. Um, I mean, as far as anything that you want to say, I'm going to get into some lighthearted questions and stuff. But is there any, you want to put a bow on anything that we've said, like in these social topics? Well, we actually never got to how I ended up being an atheist. Okay. Oh yeah, um, that's right. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> well. I always knew there were red flags right from the beginning, but I went along with it because I was so in love with God and so in love with Jesus. However, little by little, I started deconstructing. Like, I don't know if you guys remember this book that came out about a decade ago called Blue Like Jazz. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was my first sort of deconstruction because Don basically made it okay for uh, an evangelical Christian to – vote democrat Mm -hmm. so that was like one level down like oh okay well that's fine and then um i started getting more involved with uh the emerging christian movement Mm -hmm. and you know deconstructing more theology there reading people like brian mclaren Mm -hmm. and ryan 
Rob Bell. I was about to say Ryan Bell. It's like, no, two different Bells altogether. Right. Mm-hmm. Folks like them. And also, I was actually engaged to a woman uh, way back in the day. Like, I think I met her when I was like 22 or 23. And after a year of dating, we I proposed to her. But we had a very long engagement. In fact, we were together for about six years. And the reason why we're not together anymore is because out of the six years we were together, I was only happy for three of them. Mm. Yeah, she came from like a very patriarchal Calvinist family where, you know, it was my job to be the man of God, to be responsible for her like spirituality and that sort of thing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know she was supposed to serve me and and that and i knew something wasn't quite right about that but i didn't have the language to describe it and plus also since they kept coming back with the bible it's like well shit i can't really argue against uh this can i you know so it got to the point where like it was so bad that i think the therapist I was seeing at the time, one day during our session, I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up blowing my head off with a shotgun. And my therapist was like, after unpacking it, she realized a lot of it had to do with the stress from the relationship. So my therapist was like, it's like you need to get out of this relationship. And so I did. It was really – it was tough since we were together for so long, but I don't regret it one single bit. And it was actually shortly after we – my fiance and I broke up that I came out as bisexual Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, it was totally freeing a totally like new life for me where I felt finally free Um, now as far as my religion I was still deconstructing my faith during all this as well like by the time I broke up with my fiance and uh, came out as bi I was at a place where you know I was kind of a liberal Christian, you know, I knew I didn't believe that LGBT people were going to hell. In fact, I don't I think I even stopped believing in hell at that point. Right. And I had stopped believing in, you know, a literal interpretation of the Bible. In yeah. fact, and I also believed in theistic evolution, you know, God sort of guided evolution, mm-hmm. the evolutionary process. But even then I started having little questions like, OK, well, if, you know, we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. Um, when in our development did God sort of reveal himself to us? You know, did we have did we go to some sort of humanoid level where God said, OK, here I am. Boom. And, um, you know, actually, this may sound cliche, but Richard Dawkins did have a part to play in my deconversion. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't The God Delusion, though. The first book I read by him was actually The Magic of Reality, because I was mm-hmm. so I was really starting to get interested in science and biology. And so I read the book, and um, he doesn't outright say there is no God, but he definitely makes it clear that there's no supernatural magic in the world. Every All the beauty we see around us can be explained through science. And so it didn't take, uh, didn't take much to put two and two together. And then I watched a debate he did years ago with Ben Carson, Francis Collins, and Daniel Dennett. And at the time, I was still in the sort of theistic evolution camp. And so I was expecting Francis Collins, who's also in the theistic evolution camp, to totally cream Dawkins during the debate. But Dawkins kept saying again and again, well, where's the evidence? I'm a scientist. I'm a man of evidence. So where's the evidence? And I was like, evidence? Evidence? Well, uh, (laughs) um, let me get back to you on that one. And so I just started deconstructing it more. And one thing that really sort of pushed me more into atheism was this whole this sort of idea um, pushed in progressive Christianity called process theology, mm-hmm. which basically says that, you know, God and the universe are so connected that God is evolving with the universe and and the future isn't, you know, predestined. It all constantly evolves. Even God doesn't know the future. It also proposes a non-intervening God, you know, it's against God's nature to break the laws of nature. Instead, he sort of gently nudges us. And so 
at first I really bought it hook, line, and sinker. I was like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But then after a while, it, that didn't really make sense as well. It's like, okay, so if God's not an intervening God, God doesn't break the laws of nature, then, okay, we can write off, you know, the virgin birth and the resurrection of Jesus because those are two major incidences of God intervening, you know, breaking all the laws of science. And so little by little, I just started deconstructing to the point where I don't remember like the specific day I woke up and realized, oh, I'm an atheist. I just, it just, basically God just slowly vanished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, those are some very similar steps to not only myself, but a lot of people go that route. And and it's funny, Blue Like Jazz was a, all these books, you know, the, the McLaren books, Ryan, uh, Rob Bell. And, um, and then process theology, I would say like the Christians that I still – and friends with to this day, and I've had on the show like David Dark and and some others. They 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 go that route, and it it is the route of of an even more human like God um, mm -hmm. than maybe the fundamentalist would. You know, God is immutable, never changing, the same yesterday, and he's he's omnipotent, omnipresent. And this Jesus kind of especially when they really invest in Jesus. I mean, Jesus not only is the incarnation, but he came and dwelt among us, he suffered and died. It's the suffering Christ, and it's, the, and it's this God is making it up as he goes, and he's mm -hmm. learning alongside of us what it means to be human and what mm -hmm. it means to, to be love and how can love conquer evil. And, and it's, it is kind of the last step. Uh, uh, out and of course, like I said, I've got friends that are still on that last step and probably will be. They might be there till they die. Who knows? I mean, mm -hmm. everybody's on their own journey. But that's fascinating, especially the six year. I'm so sorry that three years of that was miserable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how we get ourselves into situations and we can't admit that they were wrong decisions because they were so important decisions. And yeah, how can we be wrong about those things? And we cling to those areas that are just destroying us. Um, yeah, emotionally, and so I'm glad you're out. I'm glad you're who you are. Yeah, yeah so I would think you know you mentioned that you're you're glad you did it, but I would think you would have even more elation about that because that's it sounds like a prison. In fact, it's a it's it's odd for me because my wife is so kicking against patriarchy. It's odd for me to hear a woman who's like actually wanting it, you know, imposed on her. You know, please mm -hmm. be more patriarchal to me. <laughs> It's it's kind of like uh, uh, giving up your your freedom is taught to you in the church environment. If you're a woman, there's all sorts of pressure to to not be the one in charge, um, and all sorts of very negative reinforcement when you do try to speak up. Yeah. So I can understand her saying that because she so desperately wanted to be the good christian wife oh yeah that's the model mm -hmm. and this is actually if you want if you're a christian and you're a bible believing christian the path to happiness is god's path any any step out mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. is you're outside the umbrella of god's protection and satan's going to destroy your life mm -hmm. so yeah for her this is the model established by the authority of scripture of having the best marriage and you better rise up and be the man and and lord over me mm -hmm. uh, i'm your spiritual responsibility you know boy it's pretty twisted but i'm glad you're out <clears throat> so what do you do for fun trav i actually kind of need more hobbies because most of the time on my days off i just sit in front of facebook and sort of just absorb you know all my friends uh kvetching about the new trump administration so i was like you know what i'm kind of i'd hate being constantly reminded about how shitty the world is i should probably do more to sort of you know unplug so the most i do right now is just play uh video games i got a nintendo 3ds a couple of months ago Kvetching. I'm, I had to look that up. It's to complain habitually. Mm, kind of a Jewish yeah. word, isn't it? Yeah. It's... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry if that's cultural appropriation. Yeah. Are you Jewish? I just like the word. No, I'm not. Okay. It's it's used a lot up. No, north. I love it. I yeah. learned something today. It's almost like my word of the day. Kvetching. <laughs> kvetching. Yeah. It's K V E T C H. Um, all right. So there in Maryland, you kind of have this pseudo sharing of space with your mom but you've got your own space uh what gets you out of the house i mean like do you ever you ever go out and do things you got a, you got a, a community of friends there that you hang with 
a small community of friends. I, I'm pretty much a loner, mm-hmm. and I have like a couple. Like, there's this one person that I hang out with monthly, and um, I will say this: one person that I've really become friends with is a Christian. Um, she's wow. a barista at the local coffee shop, mm-hmm. but she's a really cool Christian. Um, okay. I th- she's Methodist, so she's a little bit more on the liberal side. Um, I don't really know all of her theology, like whether or not she believes in a literal hell or whatnot, but you know, talking to her, she is the kind of person who puts people before dogma. You know, yeah. she did like adventures and missions, the world race where she went to all these different uh, countries for a year. And she talks about how she's worked with, you know, children that were rescued out of brothels. And so she definitely has a good heart. I don't really like preach atheism to her in a sense of like, you know, you're stupid for believing that crap right. or, or what, you know, on all that stuff. I, it's more like me listening to her story, her listening to my story, and we kind of understand where we're coming from. And she also hates Trump as much as I do. So that's all <laughs> fantastic. Right. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Oh, a total introvert. I could get that. Yeah. So being out and about isn't really important to you. It would drain you probably. Yeah, it does after a while. In fact, I kind of have to sort of plan my day, be like, okay, I need to run some errands, but what should I do? You know, should I get groceries today or do I have enough so I can wait until tomorrow for Mm -hmm. them? Mm -hmm. I get you on that one. I don't like stores for that very reason, talking to people. And that's weird because I'm a therapist, but I get (laughs) trained in public Mm -hmm. discourse. I do too. I mean, I think think it's okay... I mean, Johnny Carson was an introvert. Absolutely. Right? And Mm -hmm. so he's up in front of millions of people, but it's a safe place because it's actually kind of one way. And even when he did interviews, it was, you know, controlled and Mm -hmm. and short term. But, like, I I prefer to be alone, and yet I'm a preacher and a podcaster, and I love to talk, and but I hate to small talk. That's Mm -hmm. You hate small talk, Trav? (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. Mostly because I never ho- I never know how to like form a conversation. Like like every time like even on my podcast, I usually have like a list of talking points I have printed out and so so I won't like run out of things to say. Yeah. Mm. Well small talk really isn't conversation. It's it's fake. It mean, right. <laughs> it means nothing and it's just words in a group and um Well, all yeah. of these things are ways of dealing with social awkwardness. It is, yeah. And yes. uh and not dealing with the person in front of you so much as dealing with the situation so you can avoid talking to the person and being real. Yeah. So, yeah. Being present. Mm-hmm. That's a constant struggle. Um, what about uh, – do you have any form of exercise that you do? I really need to do that because <laughs> I am, like, really out of shape and, like, everyone says, you know, you should probably do some sort of exercise to help stabilize your mood. But I'm like, you know, eh, it seems like too much work. I mean, I don't think I'll ever be a gym rat or anything, but, you know, maybe I can start doing some, I don't know, stomach crunches or something. You know, just do something to keep the blood flowing instead of just laying around on my ass all day. <laughs> I like you more and more. I'm not an exercise person either, Mm -hmm. even though I recommend it regularly. So are you creative at all? Mostly with writing and Mm -hmm. the podcast. Um, That's where I mostly channel most of my creative energy. I I was a graphic arts major the first time I went to college shortly after graduating high school. But after a while, I kind of realized that I kind of suck at visual arts. And so I haven't done any drawing or painting or whatever in like years Mm -hmm. okay what do you enjoy doing well writing definitely i enjoy that although sometimes that takes a lot of energy Mm -hmm. out of me putting words together in a way they form like coherent thoughts you know in fact sometimes when i'm like really trying to hammer it out i'm like it looks like i'm like banging on the um keyboard like uh like i don't know glenn gould playing piano or something like that you know i think the fallacy is that creativity is comfortable and it's not it's very difficult and it's work you can do hard work Uh, yeah Mm -hmm. well trav you've gotten published in quite a few pretty big periodicals and stuff so like isn't there don't you write for the humanist magazine or something yeah, yeah. I haven't written for them in a while. The last article I wrote for them actually kind of was really controversial. It was a satire of the whole bathroom bill thing. Mm-hmm. And so 
I decided to write this article where I sort of do a Swiftian modest proposal and say, well, according to the studies, white cisgender men are more likely to be rapists than anyone else, so let's ban them from public restrooms. And most people got the joke, mm -hmm. but there was a huge backlash from all these, you know, ugly, mean men's rights activists, assholes online who's like, you know, thinks that if you, you know, make fun of white people, it's, it's just as bad as, you know, saying that, oh, haha, -ha, black people like fried chicken. You know, basically, they equate the stereotype of white people not putting seasoning in their food with, you know, black people liking chicken. It's like, well, no, because no one really... Number one, it's true about white people not putting seasoning in their food. And number two, no one's being, like, oppressed because of it. And that, you know, our society is, is geared towards white people. And so the worst that happens in that situation is that people get their feelings hurt, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there was, like, a huge controversy over the article. And I think even Sargon of Akkad, who's, like, one of these, you know, YouTube atheist assholes like mentioned it in a video which I think my when somebody mentioned it to me I think my exact reaction was did he spell my last name right <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well I, I'm if I have a pet peeve or I have lots but it's people that on whom irony is lost yes they, they just don't have the imagination to understand that you weren't really wanting to ban white men from restrooms I mean good grief that's just almost insulting or, or, or certainly disappointing to hear that somebody would be that lost mm -hmm. uh, and miss the irony, that, that, that blatant. Well, I think what they're projecting there is that their bathroom bills were total uh, rejection of an individual. So they're viewing that as total rejection of them because they, right. meant, they meant to hurt. And oh, I see. So wow. they, that's how they interpret your statements. Because that's uh, how they meant it and that's yeah. how they received mm -hmm. it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So I, I can see that. Um, but you did. You made the big time as long as they spelled your name right. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> All right, Trav. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. And, uh, you know, this is what we call, uh, there used to be, I can't remember the word for it. Um, swap casting, I think oh, is what it's okay. called, or something. Oh, like that. okay. I never heard that term. Me neither. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I appreciate you having me on, and I'm I'm glad that you uh, you came on, and um, um, you know, I learned a lot today. Mm. I think. I hope cool. so. Oh, cool. I hope someday I meet you in person. So yeah. Though I'm not going to invite you down here. People down here aren't so open minded. <laughs> yeah, you're probably yeah. safer up in Maryland. Yeah. Um, yeah. Coming, I. I grew up in the Northeast, so I've only been down here two years, and it still is um, culture, a shock. culture shock for me when I hear people re reacting to things that are non-issues. I'm a little still much in cu culture shock, but I'm not at risk. You are. So I would say maybe someday I'll be up north again. <laughs> cool. cool. Yeah. So thanks again, man. All right. Thank you for having me on. It was great. Okay. Bye. Have a great day. The nuns, the non-religious, unaffiliated, atheists, agnostics, humanists, and heathens are statistically the fastest growing group in the nation. But here in the Bible Belt, you'd never know it. Are you fine without faith? Are you good without a God? If you're questioning your beliefs or you're happily religion-free, join us in March for NanoCon. NanoCon, the Nashville Nuns Convention, is a one-day secular extravaganza. Last year, NanoCon drew over 400 participants for an affordable full day of speakers, workshops, vendors, music, food, and fun. The 2017 NanoCon is stepping it up with the brilliant Matt Dillahunty as keynote speaker. We are building an inclusive community of thinking people, just like you, so be there. St. Patrick's Day weekend, Saturday, March 18th. Learn more and get tickets online at www.nanocon.info. Let's get this party started. Where's the best place to meet your online friends? Where's the best party where the fun never ends? 
Where will Bobby Carey be our MC too? I bet you'd go if you only knew. It's Reason Con, it's Reason Con in Hickory, North Carolina. It's Reason Con, it's Reason Con, and the speakers couldn't be finer. We've got Matt Dillahunty and Aaron Ra. Callie Wright and Lawrence Krauss. We've got god awful movies coming to you live. And Jim Craig and Shelly Siegel really jive. It's Reason Con, it's Reason Con. Meet the people in your favorite podcasts. It's Reason Con, it's Reason Con. The conference where you'll have a blast.